Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansi. Tonight, hundreds defy public health orders in Alberta as case numbers soar. There needs to be a crackdown. We were on the scene of an anti-lockdown rodeo as Premier Jason Kenney suspends the legislature and doctors say expect cases to rise. How can public health officials break through? Also tonight, meet one of Canada's youngest vaccine recipients. We will sometime soon return to the things that she loves. Alberta lets medically vulnerable kids get the shot. When can other kids expect to get in line? The crisis in India reaches new heights. As aid pours in, people there fend for themselves. I'll show you something right now. I'm carrying a bottle of oxygen with me. The longest standing dragon bids farewell. How does it feel now to be an ex-dragon? Wow, it's a wow. Jim for living on life after the den and some of the wackiest pitches that turn to gold. We thought, I get a Christmas set. Where, where, where's that gonna go? This is The National. From coast to coast, every region of Canada faces the same challenge, a variant fueled surge that moves faster than we can vaccinate. Tonight, we'll take you through the latest on that fight. And how it's going depends on where you are. In Quebec, B.C., Saskatchewan and Ontario, case numbers are now flat or slowly falling, though hospitals are still under pressure. In Nova Scotia, Manitoba, cases are heading upward. Alberta, though, is where we begin tonight, now seeing the highest per capita infection rate of any province since the pandemic began. Infections spiraling so quickly, the province temporarily suspended its legislature. While the pressure on hospitals reaches unprecedented levels, Aaron Collins shows us some people who are determined to ignore the warnings. It's rodeo day here, and even as COVID-19 cases surge across Alberta, the crowds have arrived. We will not get sick. This whole COVID thing is a big scandemic. Hundreds of people showed up today, no masks, no social distancing, no sense that this might be dangerous. My husband has an autoimmune disease. We've never done masking or anything. And if this was as serious as they say it is, he'd be dead six times over and um, I would have caught something by now. Well, you wouldn't know it by looking at this field, but Albertans are supposed to be staying home, limiting contact with other people. There's a public health order that bans outdoor gatherings of more than 10 people. And the pushback to that is more than at just this rodeo. Across the province, anti-mask activists marched through the streets. We're just asking for enforcement of existing health regulations. And uh, we need to crack down on these protesters. Meanwhile, COVID cases continue to spike. The number of patients in Alberta's ICUs just broke a pandemic record. Pressure on the healthcare system building by the day. The numbers that we have now are concerning um, and we do expect that they will go up. The spring sitting of the provincial legislature has been suspended for two weeks to discourage MLA's travel and slow the spread. The opposition wants the government to do more. My message today to the Premier is simple. Show up, come to work, do your job. Well, that horse may have left the barn. Premier Jason Kenney wants to avoid a lockdown. Instead, he's urged people to follow the rules, including new ones aimed at cooling hotspots this weekend. But clearly, some Albertans just aren't listening. The question now is whether the Premier will do anything more to make them. Aaron Collins, CBC News, near Bowdoin, Alberta. Let's bring in Dr. Lenora Saxinger. She joins us from Edmonton tonight. And Dr. Saxinger, as an infectious disease specialist, you're, you're seeing something new in this third wave, entire families getting COVID. How, how do you deal with that? You know, I, I think we really have to reinforce the messaging that if you come home and you have any symptoms at all, you have to really isolate in your own airspace in a separate place in your home. And if you can't do that, you should really be somewhere else apart from your family to protect them. We are seeing whole families getting ill, some of them critically ill, and it's a big concern. And so part of that's going to be a public policy response, if indeed there is one. And also speaking about public policy, we saw the pictures from Bowdoin. Is there a way to reach people like that who are disregarding public health messages? That is just such a tough problem. And I, I think that the, the, the facts are that, you know, uh, scolding is not working, that opposing viewpoints um, conflicting is not working. 
I would wonder if more consistent messaging from leadership, um, potentially some restrictions, and also really trying to engage people in the place of information that they have to hand and trying to, to see if we can find common ground um, to help protect our communities would be one thing that we can start trying to do. All right, Dr. Saxinger, thank you. Thanks. Quebec Premier Francois Legault responded today to protests in Montreal against public health measures. In total, they represent a very, very small minority of Quebecers. We can see that in polls. Police people give, gave a few tickets yesterday, but if we need to do more, we'll do more. The demonstrations in front of a mass vaccination site were mostly peaceful but resulted in many appointments being rescheduled and ended in clashes after police say a group refused to leave. One officer was injured. In addition to tickets, four people were arrested. But in Montreal and Laval, rules are being relaxed. The 8 p.m. curfew in place for the past two weeks is moving back to 9.30, with the case trends in those cities better than expected. This weekend, Ontario's intensive care admissions reached a level that was once considered highly unlikely. Previous highs were much smaller a year ago and in January's second wave, but all through the month of April, the number of intensive care patients rose even higher as warnings grew ever louder, that 900 patients would be a breaking point. Even so, the province has so far avoided the level of medical triage that everyone dreaded, where the capacity for care is rationed for those most likely to recover. Tally Ricci shows us how Ontario has avoided that scenario and what could change that. Now, we do have a During this third wave, doctors have no time to slow down. I'm sorry, I got to take this one call. I'm sorry. Give me one second. Okay, Hello. But this emergency room physician found a few minutes to describe what he sees on the inside. I think the most difficult thing is coming to grips with the fact that we're having younger people who are very sick. A lot of them are requiring ICU, but there's no ICU space. Today, hospitalizations dropped below 2,000 for the first time in two weeks. But Ontario ICU admissions hit a record high this weekend, rising to 900. Health officials had warned it would be a breaking point, bringing hard decisions about who gets life-saving care. The triage tool is not in place. We're working as hard as humanly possible, our clinicians and the staff in hospitals, to uh, make sure that it uh, never comes into effect. But uh, I can't uh, say uh, with uh, complete confidence that it will never happen. For weeks now, extraordinary measures have been taken to relieve pressure, delaying tens of thousands of surgeries, putting adults into pediatric wards, building field hospitals, accepting help from the armed forces, and transferring a record high number of patients. But now a new concern. A critical link in those patient transfers, orange paramedics are prepared to go on strike. During the third wave, we have countless members working more than 60 hours a week to prevent Ontario's ICUs from collapse. They're protesting provincial legislation that caps public sector wage increases to 1% a year. They have to give notice before they can strike. Striking for us is the absolute last consideration. Even though the triage model hasn't been activated in Ontario, doctors have already received the training. We've heard about this for a few months and I always thought there's no way that we'll get to that, but we sometimes we it feels like we're days from it or weeks from it at least. It, it some days feel like that that can actually happen. And that possibility, he says, weighs on him. Yeah, yeah. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. COVID is also putting the squeeze on Nova Scotia. Today, the province reported 133 new cases, a day after posting a new record of 148. These are figures the province has never seen before. And as Kayla Hounsel explains, the growing numbers have forced a change in testing strategy. Hospitals in Halifax have reached a critical point. I'm worried and I'm, I'm a bit upset that we've uh, rocked our apple cart of so little COVID for so long. This ICU doctor says they currently have six COVID patients intubated. And for this province, that's a big deal. In all of the first wave, we had a total of eight uh, intubated COVID patients over the over the span of the of the several weeks and months of the first wave. I'm not trying to scare people, but I need to be blunt. This situation is very serious. 
This weekend's huge numbers are part of a backlog as the province works to process tens of thousands of lab tests. But this scene is a key part of Nova Scotia's strategy as the fight unfolds. People lined up to get a rapid test with no symptoms and no reason to believe they've been exposed. We've been testing almost between 3 and 5 percent of the Halifax Regional Municipality area several days in a row, each day. As of Wednesday, more than 33,000 people were tested this way during the current outbreak. 75 have been positive. But Barrett says the numbers are not what's most important. Even if one of these people tests positive, that's one person then isolating and not walking around in the community, potentially infecting so many more. We have the highest per capita rate of testing in the country. Rapid testing is driven entirely by volunteers. You can put people on the moon, you can probably figure out how to teach someone to put a swab towards the back of someone's nose without calling it a liability, a problem, or an impossibility. So those are what I would call really poor excuses. As hundreds step up to volunteer, 27 people were ticketed $2,000 each this weekend for violating lockdown regulations. It flies in the face of thousands lining up to get tested. Uh, public service, it's my second test. The rest of the world can really learn from what we're doing. Health officials call it a movement, one more tool in a complex fight. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. This weekend, drive through vaccination sites in Saskatchewan reopened for the first time in weeks, and people were willing to line up for a long time to get their shot. It's been a long wait, just over six hours. About six hours. Five hours, uh, 41 minutes. The drive throughs in Saskatoon and Regina were closed last month because of a lack of supply. Currently, anyone 40 and above in the province is eligible. This week, Alberta approved the Pfizer vaccine for kids 12 to 15 with underlying conditions. Briar Stewart introduces us to one of the country's youngest vaccine recipients and some other families who hope their turn will come soon too. What would you say, a two or a three? James Bonacici and his 15-year-old son Sam have a range of conversations these days. In this video, they're ranking cereal, but they have serious talks too about whether Sam should get the vaccine when he's eligible. He's definitely on board and I'm certainly encouraging him as like I am with everybody to get vaccinated. The Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is currently approved for ages 16 years and up but Health Canada is considering lowering the limit to 12. Okay. It's still reviewing the drug maker's results from its clinical trials, but the National Advisory Committee on Immunization has said it can be given if children are at a higher risk. 11-year-old Sophia Harani, who was diagnosed with a brain tumor at age five, got the shot on Friday. After Alberta became the first province to open vaccination up to medically vulnerable children born in 2006 to 2009. She does understand that she's going to be a bit more protected and she knows that once her friends and all the kids get vaccinated that there is hope that we will sometime soon return to the things that she loves. Last year a survey led by researchers at UBC found that 65 percent of parents want their children to have a COVID shot and experts say that could play a big role in reaching herd immunity. If you consider that children are about 20 or 25 percent of our population and that some adults cannot get the vaccine or decide not to, that means we really need to focus on the adolescent and younger children to consider whether to vaccinate them or not. Clinical trials are currently being run involving younger children, but it's teens who could soon find themselves eligible. Easton Stanley, who just turned 16, got the vaccine in March. I, I really did it to, to protect the vulnerable people like where I work in a warming shelter. It's just uh, beneficial for everyone. And he's looking forward to when the rest of his peers can get it too. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. In India, the situation grows more dire. Today, another new record in deaths, nearly 3,700 people. As Katie Simpson shows us, while the need is still great, hospitals did get some much needed supplies today. Desperately needed help is arriving in India. A plane full of oxygen tankers was urgently unloaded. As was this shipment of 100 ventilators from Germany. And more life-saving equipment sent from France. With India's medical system strained beyond capacity, this is just a fraction of what is needed to address the raging crisis. 
the situation is extremely grim. I mean, of course, there uh, is, aren't any words that can explain the situation is extremely, extremely grim. Knowing there may not be emergency help, some are taking matters into their own hands. I'll show you something right now. Is it possible I can show you something? During an interview on Rosemary Barton Live, this man who lives in New Delhi showed viewers what he carries in the trunk of his car, a much coveted oxygen tank. I have my mother. She's old. I have my pregnant wife. I have to take care of everybody. Amid India's grief, there is growing frustration. It is the world's largest vaccine producer, yet only roughly 2% of its population is vaccinated, with the rollout hampered by shortages. When the cases started rising up, I thought government had a plan. Uh, but turns out they didn't. Within the first week, I understood that the governments have no idea. And there's criticism aimed at the prime minister, who allowed festivals to continue despite the pandemic and held large election rallies. But the campaigning did not get him what he wanted. Narendra Modi's party did not pick up a state he campaigned in. The winner, the incumbent, a critic of how he's handled the COVID crisis. As more aid is sent to India from around the world, more actions are being taken to stop the possible spread of COVID. Starting Tuesday, flights from India into the U.S. will be restricted. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. At least three people were killed and dozens more injured after a boat capsized and broke up on a reef near San Diego this morning. There are people in the water drowning, uh, getting sucked out the rip current there. Uh, there's people on shore. Authorities say the boat was likely being used to smuggle migrants. 27 people were taken to hospital. The captain is in custody and speaking with investigators. The commander of Canada's special forces was put on indefinite leave today with pay. Controversy has grown for days around Major General Peter Daw after CBC News reported that four years ago he wrote a reference letter for a soldier found guilty of sexual assault. Canada's interim top soldier announced the sudden leave today, saying, It has become increasingly clear to me that Daw's actions four years ago are causing division and anger within the CAF. Blunt questions today for Canada's Defence Minister on why his department is conducting another study into sexual misconduct in the armed forces. The first one, completed six years ago, had recommended an independent body deal with complaints. When were you named Minister, sir? Um, back in uh, when we were elected, uh, back in 2015. Yeah. So, so it's 2021 now. Why have you not done any of those things that you're talking about now over the past six years? No, Rosemary, we were working towards that. We, the, what, based on the work that we were doing, we felt that we were going and had the independence based on uh, the work that Dr. Preston at SMRC uh, was doing. Every single uh, year and quarterly, we would work uh, towards, but obviously we've seen this has not have been enough. Sajjan said the government is prepared to implement major changes. Over the past five years, there were 581 reports of sexual assault in the military. An Ontario man has decided to go public with his frustrations with Bell after sales reps made him a great offer for his phone bill. The problem is the telecom giant says the offer wasn't available and a verbal agreement wasn't enough. But as Rosa Marcatelli found, some contract law experts argue that shouldn't matter. When Walter Schultz called Bell for a better deal on his mobile service, he left nothing to chance and recorded the exchanges. The recordings have three different customer service reps making the same offer. So you will have a total of 10 gigabytes. Okay, and then how much is that? Uh, that's uh, $55. But instead of delivering on the deal, Bell later told the man he couldn't have it because the plan in question does not exist. My initial reaction was, was uh, laughing. Like, this is not real. This is not happening. Bell refused to budge, so Schultz filed a complaint with the Commission for Complaints for Telecom Television Services. All I wanted was for them to honour the word. He's not alone. According to the CCTS, this kind of thing is among the most complained about by telco customers. Customers saying they were given misleading information or the contracts they got contradicted a prior agreement. This is something that we're seeing across the board. In particular, it seems to be a challenge for wireless consumers. In one case, the CCTS found in favor of a customer who said he was verbally offered a fixed price guaranteed for life, which was later denied after the telco said that offer didn't exist. 
Then there's the case go public covered in 2018. I was stunned and sort of appalled. A Toronto man took Bell to small claims court and won after the telco refused to honor a verbal contract he made with a customer service rep. Of course, sometimes telcos are in the right. It all comes down to proof, according to a contract law professor, who says a verbal agreement can be just as binding as a written one. It could be on Bell to, well, not a legal term, but suck it up. When a mistake is made by their employee, well, at least honor that, that mistake. In Schultz's case, Bell says its agents made errors in combining two separate offers, apologizing for what it calls a rare experience and saying it wants to rectify the situation. After hearing from Go Public, it offered Schultz compensation and a new deal to consider. He's thinking about it, but he says he'd rather have the one he was repeatedly offered in the first place. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Go Public. Our Go Public stories come from you. If you have a tip for the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. And developing late tonight in Ontario, Public University has narrowly avoided bankruptcy, but that's putting affiliated schools at risk. Laurentian University in Sudbury has been under court-supervised restructuring for three months after disclosing it couldn't pay its debts. The government says it's the first time this has happened to an Ontario university. In order to secure another $10 million from its lender, Laurentian will cut ties with affiliated schools, and that means Laurentian can now continue to operate until at least the end of August. But at least one of those other schools, Thornlow University, has said it's unlikely it will continue. After 15 seasons on Dragon's Den, Jim Treliving is saying goodbye. It's sort of nice not having to wear a tie after 15 years. From RCMP officer to successful entrepreneur, the Boston Pizza Mogul gives advice on what it takes to make it. Plus, a small initiative that makes a world of difference. I don't have to go and bake, you know. I don't want to bake. But first, two friends, three hours, and a little tech know-how. The result, a new grassroots method to help people book their shot. We're getting a lot of messages from people saying that they've been able to book an appointment and get on the wait list. We're back after the break. For the first time in months, clubbing is back in this Spanish town, or at least a version of it. Organizers there piloted a digital pass this weekend. A phone app that provides proof of a negative COVID test or proof that a party goer has had COVID before. The city of Liverpool in the UK also held post-pandemic test events this weekend. These people becoming the first in more than a year to legally dance the night away there. We're just excited, all of us are excited. We're all on the verge of tears, ready to go in. <laughs> Two raves in a concert were held this weekend. Participants were tested for COVID before the events. They'll be tracked afterwards, while scientists will study air quality and movement in the venue. Canadians looking forward to dancing legally will have to wait for widespread vaccination. Here in BC, one isolated community got the job done this week. In a targeted vaccination campaign, every adult was offered access to a shot. Greg Rasmussen was there. Handing over a precious cargo. Yeah, more of a risk to transfer it. I, yeah. 100%, I'm fine with that. Hundreds of doses of vaccine loaded onto a ferry, destination Denman Island, a community eager for relief. After a quick setup, I don't know what's in there. Doses are drawn, ready for those lined up. Oh, have a seat. Okay. One of the first in line is Brian Holt. Right in the tap tube. Yeah, right in the tap tube. A friend of his died recently from COVID-19. That's when it hit home that this is real. Up to that point, I was out. You know, I, was, I knew it was there, but I didn't take it seriously. Serious enough. The goal is to vaccinate every adult they can in the community over three days, quickly creating herd immunity for the island. Is your first dose? Vasilia yeah. Weiss is hoping to better protect her family, including an elderly relative in their shared workspace. I want protection. I work in a studio with my father-in-law, who's 82, and we've had to make some serious changes to try to work together. Head on over and see uh, Ariel right there. This retired nurse who lives on the island says there are a few opponents to the vaccine, but most are keen to get the shot. The proportion of anti-vaxxers is 
uh, very small compared to the amount of people that are following the guidelines. And then we made the cutting. This couple runs a winery and tasting room on the island. The vaccination blitz gives them hope, but they're unsure about the impact on their business in the months ahead. I think it'll take a lot longer than we think. And, you know, it's, it's not a one-shot deal. I think it will be with us for quite a few years to come. I think it'll make it uh, improve things. I think it'll make it better. People will be less anxious. Any vaccine you can get. That One of the nurses who lives on the island says widespread vaccination is giving people hope. Yeah, it feels really, really great, um, you know, knowing that, like, my neighbours who are always there to support me, um, that I can be part of helping protect them. What's happened on this island is what the rest of Canada is still waiting for. Almost every adult has now been vaccinated, and they're hoping it turns the tide. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, near Denman Island, B.C. Starting tomorrow in Ontario, all adults living in one of the province's designated hotspots will be able to book a vaccine. And there's a new grassroots tool to help you find a spot near you. Inspired by a similar project in the U.S., two friends, both engineers, decided to give it a go. We just thought, okay, you know, if it's not out for Ontario, maybe we can build it. So that's how they spent their Friday. The whole thing was up and running in about three hours. It's all automatic. Um, no data gets stored, so it's all privacy safe. Here's how it works. Ontario residents can text this phone number with their postal code. They'll get an instant reply with nearby vaccination sites. More than 100,000 people have used the service so far. We're getting a lot of messages from people saying that they've been able to book an appointment and get on the wait list, and so um, that's been really rewarding for us. They're not done yet. The duo says they'll expand the service to other provinces this week. And this is not Zane's only invention. He pitched some other ideas to Dragon's Den, and he's had to face the likes of Jim for living. He didn't get an investment from Jim, but others did. My investment was $5,000, and I got, I think, 2,700% return on my money. Apparently, ugly sweaters, a good bet. Coming up, Jim tells me the keys to success. But first, news from another kind of dragon. And I don't know if you can hear the applause. But we have visual confirmation. A rare nighttime crewed spacecraft splashed down. SpaceX's Dragon capsule resilience plopped into the Atlantic, carrying four NASA astronauts coming home from six months on board the International Space Station. SpaceX welcomed them back with a joke about earning 68 million miles in its frequent flyer program. Welcome back. The longest standing dragon, Jim Treliving, is bidding farewell to the den. One of the originals, he spent 15 seasons wheeling and dealing with Canadian entrepreneurs. I spoke with him about that decade and a half and what comes next. And you want to stick around to see what he does at the end of our interview. Jim, what are you thinking? Um, I, yeah, I, I'll make you an offer at, at um, 200000 for 22%. As one of the original dragons, Jim Treliving has seen all kinds of business pitches. Thank you. Jim, what do you think? Oh. That's a workout. How's that feel? Oh my God. Okay, that's dark enough. <laughs> that's dark enough. He's got to go to painting school, Nicole, big time. While Treliving is now known as one of the country's most successful entrepreneurs, the owner of Boston Pizza and co-owner of Mr. Lube, he started in a much different role. He was an RCMP officer before opening his first Boston Pizza franchise. In 2019, he was inducted into the Canadian Walk of Fame for his business success and philanthropy. Uh, for me, I think you've driven a post right through my heart for this deal, so I'm out. After 15 seasons on Dragon's Den, we wanted to know what he'll miss about the show, how the pandemic has affected his restaurant chain, and getting caught on camera during one of Canada's most famous sports moments. Jim, I wish we could do this in person, but it's fantastic uh, to talk to you. Nice to talk to you too, Ian. It's been great. I wish we were together. It'd make it a lot easier. Um, as you know, I've been a fan of Dragon's Den literally from the first day of the first show. How does it feel now to be an ex-Dragon? Wow, it's a wow. Um, you know, it's good in one thing, but I, I miss some things, and uh, especially the people that uh, work at CBC, the camera crews and all that people that work behind the scenes, they make us really look good. 
One of the great things about the program, and I think it's, it's rare in, in Canadian television, maybe even Canadian culture, is celebrating entrepreneurs like yourself and the people who would come on the show. What do you think the impact of the show has been? I think it's been fantastic across the country. And, and I get that from just people walking up to me on the street or calls or emails and stuff like that I get around the world, uh, especially in Canada and, and even outside the country now. And uh, it's amazing how, how the reach has gone to entrepreneurs everywhere. And I think the Chamber of Commerce was about four or five years ago come on and said, you people have really, our whole system is bumped up because of what you're, you people are doing on Dragon's Den. So give me an example of, of a business that you invested in in the show and stuck with it. And I don't know, maybe it surprised you or, or otherwise maybe put a little money in your pocket. Well, it, you know, I, there was a number of them. There just wasn't one that was, we, we invested in a lot across the years. But one that sticks in my mind, it was just a funny one that came on the show and it was two young guys and they were in Calgary and they had ugly Christmas sweaters. And I don't know if you remember that oh, one. Oh, I do, yeah. It, uh, we thought, ugly Christmas setter, where, where, where's that going to go? And the most amazing thing was that they were selling it in the mall, and my investment was $5,000. It, was it wasn't much. They just needed inventory. That went on for three years, and I got, I think, 2,700% return of my money. <laughs> Who would have thought? You know, just it was crazy. You are now, of course, in Canada, best known as being a dragon, but also as, as the owner of Boston Pizza, and, yep. and, and I just think back to this last year. I mean, very few industries have been hit as hard as, as restaurants. And there you are, and, you know, right across the country, all kinds of different rules. What's that? Uh, how, how has the pandemic affected that business? Well, it's, to say the least, Ian, it's been trying, really trying. And, and it's harder on, uh, but, you know, as a franchise company, that's probably one of the best things that we ever did when we completely went franchising across the country. Because these are individual operators and franchisees that live in a town, are, are probably grew up there in some cases or around that area. They know the area uh, and they get a lot of customers and, and, and people that come to the restaurant all the time just to support their local restaurants. And to me, that was what's been a, a real godsend for us. What sort of lessons do you think? you have uh, in all your years of being a business person and what you've seen on Dragon's Den, what lessons in terms of entrepreneurship do you have for Canadians? Well, I think the biggest thing is that you want to get into a business that you really enjoy and you are, are fairly good at. And you can test that out first with your parents if you want or your family, but test it with people you don't know to see if that works. The second thing you got to have more than anything else is you got to have your numbers. You may think it's the greatest thing in the world and it just doesn't work. And it, nobody's going to lend you money or put money in front of you or do anything with you unless you can see where you can make some money with this. The, the great entrepreneurs and the ones we've seen so far and I've invested in have done really well. Jim, as I'm talking to you, I, I'm thinking back to an interview I did with you 11 years ago. We have three dragons in our studio tonight. First time we've had three guests, and first time we've had three guests with both the star power and the net worth of you three. And, uh, and, and people started coming to the studio while we did that interview. And at one point when we were done, you opened up the door, and it was like the Beatles. All of a sudden, all these people were cheering, and, and, and you walked out there. And, and one of your other dragons uh, w was in the interview as well, and she, and, and she came over and said to me, Jim loves this. <laughs> Jim loves this public reaction. Are you going to miss that? Uh, Are you no, miss I am, and, and we still get it. The, the greatest thing with television, Ian, as you know, that we could, we could be gone 10 years, and Bonanza was on five years after they finished or any of the programs, and we'll be there for a while seeing it, and I still get people walk up to me in the street. Uh, when I walk around Stanley Park, uh, the same thing. Uh, they stop me and say hi, you know, and they it, you know the greatest thing is that they probably don't know how to pronounce my last name, but they know it's Jim from Boston Pizza. And I love that because it helps our brand. It does everything else besides just helping me. But there's one other thing I want to ask you about. I saw a picture, Toronto Raptors on their way to winning a championship and the shot by Kawhi Leonard. And there you yes. and your wife are perfect seats watching that moment. We can see the picture, but tell me what it was like for you. It was unbelievable. I saw the ball in the air and heard the buzzer at the same time. And the look on my face was, oh my God, it's over. They, it, even the ball goes in. I didn't realize that if the, when the ball was in the air, it doesn't matter whether the buzzer goes off, it's got to fall. And that was what my concern was. And she was going, 
crazy. And I'm still looking with this look. And my son sent me a message a day later and said, Dad, did you pass away? And you didn't even, <laughs> you look like you're, you're dead. You weren't enthusiastic at all. And I said, well, I heard the buzzer. And that was what we thought was overtime. Hey, listen, so you're a hockey guy, not a basketball guy. So you're forgiven yeah. for not understanding exactly when that point <laughs> would, would count. Thanks, Ian. Jim, you are a fantastic guy. I've, I've had the pleasure of uh, interviewing you over the years, and, and I wish you the best of luck for what's next. Uh, I think the biggest thing is what's next is going uh, doing our charity work with Cam H and, and, the, and the David Foster Foundation and other charities we're involved with, Kids Help, Phone Line, and so on. And I think the other thing is, uh, you know, I want to push more on our Boston pizzas, maybe you're right, and other parts of the world. But after this pandemic's over, there's lots of other things to do. And uh, you may see me somewhere else that never know where I'm going to show up again. All right. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. And there's one thing I want to do before I leave. What's that? For years, I wear a tie. <laughs> the first time I see everybody's wearing loose and, and, and enjoying life. And you know what? It's sort of nice not having to wear a tie after 15 years. Yeah, a little bit like Brian Burke there. Looks uh, hey, good on you. No jacket. I can take my jacket off and really enjoy life now. Nice. All right. Well, if I golfed, I would I, say I'd see you on it, the golf it, course. It was a lot of fun. Thank yeah. you, Ian, for this right. interview because you right. you're fantastic. All right. Talk to you soon, I hope. We will. Take care. And he was one of our guests on Cross Country Checkup earlier today on CBC Radio. Viewers or listeners, I guess, could ask questions. And one asked a question that I wish I had asked, which is, if he had pitched Boston Pizza at the beginning to the Dragons, would they have invested? And he said, look, I had no business plan. I really didn't have a clue uh, what I was going to do with that restaurant. So he says, not a chance. They would never have invested in his business. But worked out pretty well for him. It is never too late to, to start a new business or to learn something new. A Toronto mom learns to shred and inspires thousands on TikTok. But first... We got no work, barely enough to survive in this house. A grassroots initiative offers not only food, but also relief. That's next. Over the course of the pandemic, outdoor fridges have popped up in spots across the country, including eight in Toronto. The idea is simple. Hungry people take what they need, and people with something to spare leave what they can. McPurden spoke with those who depend on those donations as they shared their stories of survival. Nothing in there, Mama. Nothing in there, Mama. I just come to see what I can get. Something to eat for supper. Or if I get some toothpastes and toothbrush, I'm good to go. That's Bernice Sampson. She's the first person I meet at this community fridge in downtown Toronto. Outdoor fridges like these began to pop up across the city when the pandemic began. Thank you, thank you. The idea is as simple as the motto. Take what you need, leave what you can. But at the moment, these fridges are empty. And if I need bread or eggs or something, if there's something there, I just take one or two things. I'm on a pension, a fixed income, and, you know, everything's very expensive now in the stores. Diane Hansen is one of the many people who come here every day in the hope of finding some food. The reality is, with COVID, it's been a hard year for people financially. Makes me wonder. Can something as simple as a few outdoor fridges really make a difference? Well, if there's lots of food in there, it feels good. But sometimes there's certain people come here and they bring their shopping carts, they clean it all out. They don't leave nothing for anyone else. But I think that's very rude. Sometimes I grab things and give to my neighbors that, that don't have anything. As I talk with Diane, food arrives. I got some shrimps oh, with frozen. So I'm going to put them in the freezer. I'm going to cook those right now. Yeah, they yeah. They don't take it all. Coconut oil? Sure. That's good stuff. Put it on your skin. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Love I need it. the onions. Good evening, Apple. Bless you. Thanks. The person who just stocked the fridges is Catherine Aaron. She lives nearby and brings food as often as she can. Oh, this always good, honey. One light here. Good evening. Thank you very much. I just dropped off whatever I had that I wasn't using, and it all gets taken like within five minutes, five, ten minutes. It always goes. I came this morning, everything was empty. There wasn't a single thing left in here. And I stopped it full, and like I'm pretty sure it's empty already again. 
For Catherine, helping comes naturally. She's a frontline nurse who's worked through the pandemic, and she cares about her neighborhood. I know these people. I see them on the streets. I see them struggling. I see them begging, sleeping on the sidewalk, and they're my family. They're my brothers and sisters. They're my friends, and why wouldn't I want to help them if I could? Got a box of British shrimp. The ain't no more British shrimp. They're gonna go in my stomach in a while when I go home. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, someone wants to give back something to the community. So it feels good to know that people are doing that for the community. Not only for me, for the kids, for the old ones, for people that don't have nothing. This doesn't just happen right here. There are eight locations with fridges scattered across the city. Most of them are in front of businesses. Volunteers bring food and clean them, but there's no set schedule. Food arrives when food arrives. Take this fridge in front of Jake Silva's ice making business. Jake helped set it up and now he stocks it throughout the week. We've seen a lot of people come on a daily basis, a lot of the same people coming. And, uh, you know, we can see a, a, a definitely a need, you know, in the community for, for food. We've been operating our business in this neighborhood for over 40 years. It's a good neighborhood. <laughs> it is a good neighborhood. Um, I grew up in this neighborhood. And uh, it's really important for us to find ways to give back. What'd you get? A couple of milks and some cheese. Sir, let me ask you this. Why, why do you come here? Because I don't I got no work, barely have to survive, and this helps. This helps me get through the day and the month, and the I'll... year, and the week. It's one thing to hear about people's struggles over the last year with the pandemic. Hey, the floor again. And how it's hurt low-income Canadians the most. But when I spend time at the fridges, I see it firsthand over and over again. I got a tomato and I got spinach. I can make a salad. They're expensive. Patricia Reed is 80, retired, and lives on a fixed income. She's here because she needs to save money. I have to pay $4,000 for my tooth implants, and I'll give up food for that, because teeth are really important in health. I have to really give my food money away to that. I figure I got another 20 more years on this life, and I'm sure as heck I'm not gonna waste it. <laughs> Patricia wants people to know that the fridges make a difference in her life. I just would say thank you so much. You have eased my life. You know, that's what they've done. And I couldn't imagine somebody being so kind. I, I get really worked up about that. But it's given to me, it's, I don't have to go and bake. You know, I don't want to bake. If that were the only thing that these community fridges accomplish, I'd say that's pretty big. Nick Purden, CBC News, Toronto. Well, a beautiful piece and a nice touch at the end. The moment is next. This Toronto mom has been blowing up on TikTok, inspiring people with her recently acquired skateboarding skills. Orby Roy, who goes by Auntie in her videos, used to think it was too late for her to get into skateboarding, but when her kids started learning, she did not want to miss out on the fun. So she joined in and documented it on TikTok. Her hobby and her popularity is our moment. I started Auntie Skate specifically because it was a really dark period in January, February, and specifically this year because of COVID. And so I created Auntie Skates just to have fun, to spread joy and positivity and, and show people that you can live your best life and you can break down barriers. I was actually overwhelmed by the response. I, I didn't expect it. I didn't expect so many positive comments. Things that people are writing, uh, you've inspired me. Uh, you, you don't know how dark my day was. You've made my day. My kids, uh, my kids think I'm super cool now. You know, they like to show off at school that their, their mom is on TikTok. 
It brings me so much joy to be outside in the sun with my kids. I don't know, they're quite young still, they're eight and 11. I don't know how long they're gonna wanna hang out with me. It's, I really feel so blessed to have this. So Auntie is the name of a character that she uh, developed in improv class. And I mean, as remarkable as it is to learn how to skateboard like that in your 40s, I think even more remarkable, a couple of things she said. First of all, her kids actually think she's cool, at least for now. And all the comments on social media are positive. That is The National for May 2nd. Good night. <laughs>